Welcome back to our weekly seminar, Viewing Multidimensional Poverty from Many Angles. I'm James Foster, co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, in the Elliott School of International Affairs of the George Washington University. I'm your moderator of uh, today's event, uh, coming to you from Washington, D.C., Oxford, U.K., and New York, New York, entitled Moderate Internationally Comparable MPI, presented by Dr. Lina Shea of the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency. Today's discussion will be provided by Ivan Gonzalez de Alba of the UNDP and Khalid Abu Ismail of UN ESQA, the Commission for Western Asia. This is the third in a series uh, co-sponsored by IIEP and its two partners, the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, or OFI, in the Department of International Development of Oxford University, and the Human Development Report Office, or HDRO, of the United Nations Development Program. I'd like to express my appreciation to these partners for co-sponsoring the series and to the many be benefactors of IIEP for their continued support. I'm also happy to announce that this is the first day for our new Dean at the Elliott School, Dr. Alyssa Ayers, who's an expert on the history and politics of South Asia. Welcome, Dr. Ayers. In a moment, I will turn over the mic to my colleague, Sabina Alkair, who is uh, pictureless today, uh, to set the stage and introduce today's speakers. But first, a few words about our institute. IAEP is a research institute whose objectives also include convening discussions of the key questions facing the international community. For example, last Friday, our Rethinking Capitalism and Democracy series featured a brilliant presentation on climate change by, Dr. by Sir David Hendry of Nuffield College, Oxford, with the intriguing title, Taking Stock of Climate Change. Earth, Air, Fire, and Water. Our China Conference series recently featured David Lampton of Johns Hopkins discussing the state of US-China relations. And next Wednesday on February 10th, our Envisioning India series will feature Karthik Muralidharan from UCLA and Rukmini Banerjee of the Pratham Education Foundation discussing human capital in India. If you miss any of our events for our series, you can watch them asynchronously on our YouTube channel, IEPGW. The present series is a bit different in that we're focusing exclusively on examining the key problem of global poverty through the lens of the MPI, a specific measure of poverty that captures and documents the problem in all its dimensions, thus allowing for more effective policy solutions. The goal of this series is to bring scholars together from around the world to take a deep dive into the MPI technology, refining its interpretation and implementation. Last week, Sabina Alkair presented a paper with a myriad results on the global MPI through time. Next week's paper, presented by Jakob Dirksen, will consider several strategies for constructing MPIs for children. Today's presentation moves away from acute poverty as measured by the standard global MPI to a moderate version, which raises cutoffs and expands the set of the poor to a larger set of moderately poor people. Without further ado, let me turn it over to my colleague, Sabina Alkair, who's waiting for us in Bhutan, the director of OFI, uh, who will introduce the series and our guests from this point on. Sabina. Thank you so much, and apologies uh, for the video malfunction. Um, it's my delight to welcome Dr. Elena Sheha, who will present this paper. Um, Elena has, is, is the lead economist in Swedish CETA uh, and has worked across um, many different areas, but particularly um, in, in this, it's her own work is reflecting the commitment also that Swedish CETA has and that she has written about 
taking a multidimensional view of poverty and integrating it alongside their other priorities. Um, personally, she's also worked in Rwanda, um, also in the World Bank, um, and she did a doctorate in the University of Sussex um, back uh, before. And so it's it's really a, a joy to have her um, uh, to to present and and share this work, which is uh, a, an experimental work and really trying to test out what methodology could take. Um, understandings of global poverty that are comparable across a number of countries up uh, to country regions like Latin America and like the Arab states, um, where maybe the global MPI is too acute a measure to be policy relevant. And so I'm delighted also to welcome Ivan Gonzalez del Alba, um, who is currently joining from Cambodia. Um, prior to that, he was a regional um, in, in the regional office of UNDP and has a doctorate in Oxford uh, and before that worked in government of Mexico. So uh, covers many of the different footsteps of work on multidimensional poverty, um, which was a topic of his own research. And I'm also similarly really delighted to welcome Dr. Khaled Abu Zayel from ESWA in Beirut. And Khaled um, uh, has again advanced very innovative work on middle income groups on uh, the Arab MPI, a regional measure, uh, and trying again to get a measure that's more appropriate for that context where the global MPI simply is not so informative um, in many of the countries. Uh, Khaled uh, did his doctorate in the New School and has brought a really uh, a cutting edge perspective to a lot of these questions and a fresh energy. So I really believe this will be an important discussion. And it's an important discussion to include you, the listeners, as well, because this is not finished work. Uh, this is work that's unfolding and where more minds are needed to really think about what will be a genuine contribution going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's turn it over then to, to our speaker. Proceed, Alina. Thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and also for the opportunity to talk and address this uh, distinguished audience that covers both academics, uh, practitioners and policymakers alike. Because although the uh, topic might uh, bring you to think about uh, poverty indices and the technical aspects around it, this talk is inherently about something bigger. It's about envisioning a future of uh, eradicating poverty in all its forms everywhere. And I hope this talk uh, triggers some thinking and provides food for thought. And me and my co-authors are very much looking forward to your comments and questions uh, after the talk. So let me bring up the presentation. Uh, so the title of the day is Moderate International, uh, Internationally Comparable uh, MPI. And it's based on a paper that is jointly written by Sabina Alkayer, Fanny Kavesti, uh, Frank Vollmer, and yours truly, all authors joining this uh, call today. Before I go into the nitty gritties of the index itself, I wanted to give you of the motivation uh, and the goal of this work. Why are we bothered in the first place? Um, all our countries and governments have committed themselves to Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals that provide us with the bold uh, agenda to end poverty and hunger in all their forms and dimensions and to ensure that all human beings can fulfill their potential in dignity and equality and in a healthy environment. The agenda itself is not uh, completely explicit about what these forms and dimensions are. But what is very clear is that we are not talking about survival. We are not talking about acute destitute poverty, but we are talking about every person's right and opportunity to live a life in dignity. At the moment, how we are measuring our progress falls short from this ambition that we have committed ourselves to. And the aim of this uh, presentation and index is to bring us up to par to the ambition level that is stated and putting our money where our mouth is uh, to, to uh, live up to the uh, expectations and ambition level stated in the SDG goals. 
So let's look at the gap and where we are today and why a new uh, un unique uh, and universal indicator might be needed. At the moment, the SDG agenda uh, is mainly measured in monetary ter terms. Uh, the SDG 1 is measured by the International Monetary Poverty Line that was constructed by the World Bank uh, by taking the average of the national poverty lines in the poorest uh, countries. Uh, these poverty lines have been uh, made internationally comparable using international PPP dollars of $1.9 a day. Uh, that allows global comparison and this uh, indicator has been immensely powerful and very useful in tracking our uh, immense progress uh, to reducing poverty levels. But I think few would disagree if I say that this bar is set uh, very low. It is constructed by in the poorest uh, context in the world and in the middle income countries where the majority of poor live nowadays, the national ambition level is set higher. So most countries have their national poverty lines uh, in monetary terms uh, that measure what poverty, income poverty means in their context, uh, that is above the 1.9 line. But these national poverty lines cannot be compared uh, across countries as they track different consumption baskets uh, and thus cannot be used as a universal measure and a universal um, uh, ambition level for income poverty. Uh, in order to remedy this and in order to provide a trajectory out of poverty from acute poverty to moderate poverty to finally uh, sustainable poverty reduction in monetary terms, the uh, World Bank has formulated two additional poverty lines. One that reflects lower middle income countries at $3.2 a day and another that reflects higher middle income countries at $5.5 a day. These are internationally comparable. And they provide stepping stones uh, where you can track where people are uh, in, in your country and set the international standards in monetary terms. However, the SDG agenda talks about poverty in all its forms everywhere. So what we have in the uh, multidimensional sphere that is globally adapted uh, and, and internationally comparable, uh, we mainly turn ourselves, uh, our attention to the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, uh, MPI, that was introduced by OFI and UNDP for some uh, 10 years ago. It highlights human capabilities and overlapping deprivations. And I think, uh, assume a majority of the listeners are familiar with this, uh, with this index. It looks at health, education and living standards with standard indicators that allows global comparison. Uh, and again, has been uh, very instrumental in our understanding of uh, non-monetary dimensions of poverty. However, that indicator was set during the uh, uh, Millennium Development Goals era, where the focus was more on acute poverty, and it was framed to capture acute forms of poverty. Even here, the middle-income countries and, and other national governments uh, have commonly formulated their own levels of ambition that are higher uh, than the global multidimensional poverty index. In many of these contexts, the MPI is, is close to zero, uh, whereas the national uh, ambition level uh, is, is higher. But again, the same thing as with the income poverty lines is that they cannot be compared uh, across countries and they cannot be used to set a universal standard for multidimensional poverty. Uh, poverty, uh, policy setting, and setting, and, and tracking progress. Recently, the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index has been complemented with a gradient of different level of multidimensional poverty. This gradient has, is lower uh, than the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index. It provides information about the low poverty dynamics at the lower end of the scale, allows us to track those left the furthest behind, but it does not allow us to track progress that is in line with the SDG goals uh, ambition level and does not allow us to provide the pathway out of sustainable uh, poverty, uh, towards sustainable poverty reduction. Uh, 
So what we are trying to do with this new moderate multidimensional poverty index is to raise the level of ambition uh, so that it is at par with what has been promised. Uh, it is at par with the Sustainable Development Goals agenda uh, and not at the acute level of poverty as the current SDG uh, progress measures are. That it, it, it introduces a global measure that is comparable across countries and in all income categories so that we have set a universal human standard for uh, multidimensional poverty measurement. And we would like to provide a gradient that is similar to the uh, income measures uh, that allows us to uh, track progress in multidimensional poverty at different levels. What we are also introducing uh, is the possibility to gender disagreement disaggregate and provide some extra information about gender disparities uh, in poverty that hasn't been uh, available in the previous measures. Even though there are a lot of measures that tick some of these boxes, the value added of the global multidimensional poverty index is that it brings all of these together. So it, it ticks all these boxes and provides uh, a universal measure that could uh, be used to set a new policy standard. So how does this new animal looks like? Uh, well, it is based on the Alkai Foster method developed by Sabina Alkai and James Foster, uh, present here today uh, in 2011. And uh, for those of the listeners who are not familiar with this method, I will just recap some of the key characteristics so that uh, you can uh, follow the development of this approach going forward. So it is an indicator that is based on dual cutoff counting approach. So you first select the indicators that you think are relevant for tracking multidimensional poverty. And for all these indicators, you decide the level of uh, deprivation at which, or level of achievement at which the household or, or individual is no longer considered deprived in that indicator. So say for education, how many years of schooling does an individual need to have in order not to be deprived in education? You then count the deprivations across all these indicators to get a, a deprivation uh, measure and uh, you compare that with your poverty uh, cutoff. So which share how many indicators does the person need to be deprived in, in order to be called uh, multidimensionally poor uh, in your com combined index. The approach itself is flex flexible with your choice of indicators, what dimensions you uh, choose to use and the weights that you attach to each of, each of these uh, indicators. But the value added of accounting the deprivations across the scale is that it captures the overlapping deprivations and joint deprivations, allows us to see how poverty looks like for people living in multidimensional poverty and capture that in one measure, which is the MPI measure. That's a product of two factors. It's a product of uh, the incidence of poverty. So what percentage of people are living in multidimensional poverty and the intensity of poverty. So the average deprivation share, uh, how many of these indicators do they tick, uh, where they tick the box, where they are below the deprivation uh, cutoff. So in one measure, uh, we can look at the depth and breadth of uh, poverty. And when need be, we can also uh, uh, disaggregate the results by sub-region or population group. And it gives uh, the possibility for more granular analysis. The most uh, well-known application of this method is the uh, global multidimensional poverty index that I just mentioned. Uh, it's used uh, widely, published uh, jointly with the UNDP, and it covers uh, over 100 uh, countries with uh, representative household uh, surveys. It is based, it uses three dimensions of non-monetary poverty, namely health, education and living standards. These dimensions are well uh, established in the literature. Uh, they are uh, in line with the capability approach and also used in the human development uh, index uh, as well known uh, necessary conditions for not being uh, multidimensionally poor. These three dimensions are then measured by 10 indicators. 
and all of these dimensions are weighted equally. So all of the three dimensions get one third of the weight and all the indicators within these dimensions are also weighted equally, so-called equal nested weights. And here the poverty cutoff has been chosen to be one third. So uh, a household or individual is poor if they are deprived in one third or more of the weighted indicators. Uh, the MPI is also calculated at different poverty cutoffs. So at uh, so people who are deprived in 20% of the indicators or people who are deprived in 50% of the indicators. That gives us some of the gradient uh, with respect to the indicators described. What the moderate MPI then does is that we keep the basic structure that we consider to be well-founded uh, and use the same three dimensions of multidimensional poverty, health, education, and living standards. But we redefine what it means to be deprived in health, what it means to be deprived in education by adjusting the uh, nine of the 10 indicators at higher level of well-being so that they are at par with the ambition level stated in the SDG uh, agenda. So in some of the indicators, it means that we raise say the number of uh, years in school and in some indicators it means that we are adding additional criteria uh, in order to better capture uh, the essence uh, of that dimension by choosing to use it to do it this way uh, by construction the mmpi is a superset of the global mpi which means that everybody who's mmpi poor are also poor in the global MPI setting and also poor in, in destitute um, uh, MPI, which is a lower end variation of the same, which then provides us with the meaningful gradient in multidimensional poverty and allows us to track the pathway uh, out of multidimensional poverty. It provides us the global comparison uh, as it's based on uh, the nationally representative uh, data, and it benefits from the familiarity and wide recognition of the uh, dimensions so that policymakers are, uh, can easily adapt uh, the new measure. It parallels the uh, destitution measure that I mentioned uh, before that provides the subset of the global MPI poor. So the uh, MMPI is a superset and the destitute uh, MPI is a subset of MMPI poor with the same methodology of, of adjusting the deprivation cutoffs. So that's the basic structure. And this is something that we have thought long and hard about. And uh, I just wanted to bring you some insights on the considerations. Could we have done this otherwise? Uh, the answer is yes, we could have done it otherwise. And uh, one of the biggest discussions was really if we should have used other dimensions, added other dimensions. If we look at the national or other regional measures uh, in middle income countries, they usually uh, include employment. Uh, there's also uh, the World Bank suggestion to uh, include human security. We could have asked, uh, thought about uh, power and voice uh, indicators in this sense. However, if you look at the data, uh, if you want to create a global uh, indicator, you need that kind of data to be represented in the same sample, in the same uh, survey. And the surveys that measure uh, health, education and living standards usually don't include uh, employment or human security or the other dimensions. So although it would have been desirable, it was technically unfeasible uh, to include that. We could have also used different indicators. So we just, we don't adjust the existing ones. We just choose completely different ones. However, there is quite a lot of scope to uh, adjust the uh, existing indicators. And by choosing other indicators, we would have broken the comparability uh, with the other indicators and couldn't provide the uh, pathway out of poverty, which would have been a high price to pay. pay. Instead of adjusting the deprivation cutoff, we could have uh, adjusted the poverty cutoff. But those poverty cutoffs have already been uh, uh, adjusted and they still don't, even if you get more people uh, living in poverty, you don't get the added ambition level uh, that SDG agenda promises. And that wouldn't get us closer to the vision of 
what it really means to be out of poverty, what it really means not to be poor anymore. So we're quite confident that that is uh, as good as it gets, but we're looking forward to your uh, comments and suggestions on that. So how did we adjust these dimensions then? If we look at education, there are two important innovations or, or uh, uh, things to be borne in mind. The global MPI uh, measures education uh, by saying that one person in the household should have at least six years of primary education. We know from uh, the literature that secondary education uh, is usually a key for productive employment and it's a uh, key for meaningful engagement uh, in your society. We were, were reminded by the uh, Human Development Report from last year uh, that there has been great progress in primary capabilities, um, but it is the enhanced capabilities such as secondary education uh, that are decisive on whether people are going to stay in poverty or rise themselves and their families out of poverty. The SDG agenda envisions um, secondary education of up to 12 years, but out of which nine are compulsory. So in order not to be deprived in the MMPI sense, we require people to have at least nine years of education that includes lower uh, secondary for adults and the uh, children to stay at school and attend uh, class 10 that in many countries are uh, uh, is the level at which the secondary education is completed. We add also another uh, important uh, innovation or, or novelty into the education indicator, saying that it's not enough that to have one person in the household having education, but we want two adults to have education and them being one man and one woman. The SDG has uh, goals for gender equality and also the educational goal is set for all without discrimination, uh, making it explicit that we want one man and one woman uh, to be educated allows us to unearth some of the inequalities that were uh, not visible before and we get some uh, interesting dynamics uh, compared to the country context and also can draw, draw policy attention uh, to these issues going forward. So those are the main changes in education. If we look at the two main changes in health, uh, we need to recall that in the global multidimensional poverty index, uh, health is measured by uh, the indicator of child mortality. Luckily, the countries in the world have made great progress in reducing child mortality over the years. And in many countries, uh, the levels are very very low. So this uh, indicator hasn't uh, been that influential uh, in at least in uh, middle income settings. Also, if you think of what health means to you, it's people usually think of something more than uh, child mortality. So in the MMPI measure, uh, we look at what the SDG agenda uh, envisions and they envision universal health coverage. Uh, the data that exists uh, is about health insurance that here is used to proxy uh, the universal health coverage. So what we, in order not to be deprived in health, the household will need to have no children uh, who have died during the fa past five years and that all members of the household need to be covered by a health insurance. This is a bit of a risk taking uh, because data gaps remain, but we think that it is conceptually important uh, to um, have a broader definition of health. And we remain uh, confident that the next wave of household surveys uh, plan to improve data access uh, in this indicator. The other health indicator included in the uh, global MPI uh, is undernutrition. Uh, but SDG agenda defines malnutrition as both over and underweight. We also know that the non-communicable diseases uh, are an increased burden for the middle-income countries. Uh, and so we are adding obesity uh, as a sign of the overweight part of the SDG agenda and as a proxy for uh, non-communicable 
communicable diseases uh, in the middle income settings. So in order not to be deprived in this indicator, you need to be not underweight, but not obese either, uh, according to the strict WHO definition. And finally, we look at the living standards part of the uh, measure. So here we have six indicators. Uh, and just to sum up the main change, uh, we adjust the ambition level from the global MPI acute poverty measure up to what can be reasonably expected uh, in a middle income setting and also what is uh, described in the SDG agenda. So for example, for drinking water, well, it was earlier enough to have safe drinking weather within 30 minutes walk. Now we require piped uh, water on premises. Uh, that is one of the SDG standards. We also make three uh, important additions uh, to these indicators. One is in housing. Uh, instead of increasing the standard of high housing even higher, we say that you need decent uh, housing, housing standards, but you also need place for yourself in that house. So we're adding overcrowding that is mainly an issue in urban areas in uh, more developed areas. And here we use the UN habitat definition of not having more than three persons per sleeping room. In the assets, we add more and better assets, but we also include uh, non-monetary or non uh, or, uh, financial assets uh, to the set uh, of, of your asset base. And uh, that is to bring about uh, the literature that exists on financial engagement and how important that is for uh, finding pathways out of poverty. We're also looking at electricity uh, that was previously defined as having access to electricity, but in order to make useful use of it, you need to use the electricity and not just have access to it. Uh, the data on access to uh, use of electricity is, is relatively poor. So we are proxying this by having access to internet or smartphone that gives you the uh, possibility to use and engage in your society. So these were the uh, theoretical adjustments that we did, recoded the code and tested how, how would this work? How would it pan out in practice? The uh, code or the method was tested on six pilot countries. Bangladesh, Guatemala, Iraq, Serbia, Tanzania, and Thailand. Uh, these countries come from very different income categories and, and different uh, levels of, of uh, development. They come from different geographic regions and have, have very different um, uh, income di development dynamics. This is not a representative sample, uh, but hopefully broad enough to give you a flavor of how it would work uh, in different settings. What is common between these countries is that they have recent household data available and that they use DHAs or mixed surveys that are standardized and thus comparable uh, across countries and allows us to com combine a global indicator. So here are the main results. And before I go to the results of the uh, moderate MPI, I will bring you the uh, uh, gradient of, of this discussion. These are the headcount poverty rates for the destitute MPI measure that we have been discussing. For three of these uh, sample countries, um, this might not be uh, the most driving policy indicator as uh, people are not destitute, multidimensionally poor. In country settings like Tanzania, this there are still people who are uh, very much left behind uh, that need to be uh, lift it up. But again, um, very low levels in, in the other countries. If we then look at uh, the global M MPI uh, poverty incidence, we still see that in Serbia and Thailand, which are higher uh, middle income countries, um, the global MPI levels are very low, whereas you start seeing a significant variation uh, in the other countries. Um, in Tanzania, over half of the population are MPI poor. If we now bring it up to the level that is uh, envisioned in the SDGs, uh, you see that there is a, a variation in the country results. Uh, 
positive results in, in all uh, our sample countries. But the, um, uh, the sequence uh, is still pretty much the, the same. So we're capturing that Serbia is still best off as it was in all of these indicators. And Tanzania uh, has the most challenges. And this is something that we want to see in a robust um, uh, poverty indicator. We see that there is a variation in, in the poverty uh, incidence. This is similar to uh, the spread of incidence also in the global MPI. If we look at what this means in the, in the level of uh, income poverty or, or um, uh, development levels of the country, here we have shown the uh, uh, level of uh, poverty incidence with the uh, monetary poverty lines, where the green one, 1 1.9, is for low-income countries, and the red and bl black one are for middle-income countries. And you can see that the moderate MPI uh, is reasonably well in line with the uh, uh, monetary indicators. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's higher, and that's also normal uh, as the non-monetary uh, dimensions of poverty do not always align with the um, uh, monetary poverty. And this is uh, pretty much the spread and, and uh, uh, relation that we were expecting. So this is how it looks like in these countries. If we look deeper inside uh, the indicator, we can see that we are able to unearth different um, aspects of multidimensional poverty that were not visible with the global MPI. For instance, uh, health uh, is coming out more strongly uh, as a characteristics of multidimensional poverty with the MMPI that broadens the definition of, of uh, health. And that also brings the policymakers aware uh, of the remaining challenges uh, within, uh, 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 within health. Also, the education uh, becomes more more significant but that varies across the countries and and how um, the level of education uh, to begin with so there are interesting dynamics that can be uncovered uh, with this new uh, indicator we can also break the results down by the age group uh, and here we see that the children are the most deprived also in the new indicator this is similar to uh, the findings in the global mpi and uh, also monetary indicators so this is uh, this is positive in a sense that it tells us that we are not just picking up random variation. This is in line and reinforcing uh, the overall, overall poverty trends, but it brings out the level and the uh, nature of poverty that still exists in middle income country uh, context. This result is true for all except for Thailand, where the elderly come out as the most deprived group. The results can also be broken down by uh, sub-regions within a country. And here, in the case of Guatemala, uh, that is generally a, a middle-income country, uh, there is a high variation, regional variation within the indices. And here, the policymakers are able to uh, narrow their attention and see the remaining challenges in different types of the, um, in different um, parts of the country. Uh, and what type of uh, deprivations there still exists uh, that are now illuminated by this new uh, indicator. So in order to wrap up, what are the next steps and where, where are we at the moment? So what we are proposing today uh, is a new comparable poverty measure uh, that brings us from the acute measures up to the par of uh, the Agenda 20, 2030 and our promise of eradicating poverty in all its forms everywhere. Uh, these empirical findings show that this trial measure uh, is not uh, a pipe dream, it's a feasible, uh, and it highlights uh, uh, relevant parts of poverty uh, that, were unable to, that we were unable to see with uh, previous measures. Uh, we're still struggling with data limitations uh, in terms of coverage and reliability. And uh, we need to work more with large-scale testing and redefine the, refine the indicators uh, before this can be introduced uh, as a final robust measure. And here we are, would very much like to hear uh, from you and the discussions about whether we set the ambition level high enough 
at the moment it already hits over 90 percent in tanzania um but very low in in uh, uh, serbia is that the right way to go is it high enough for whom should we only have a middle income indicator but that then we need to abandon the idea of of universal standard uh, as envisioned in the SDG agenda, that is a universal agenda. What is acceptable as a universal standard of, of well-being? And also, if there are some uh, policy uh, considerations or specific questions that policy need, makers need answers to, that should be incorporated out of that perspective in order to get more traction uh, for this new measure. Because the aim here, as mentioned, is to introduce a measure that lives up to the dream and promise of SDG that is universally accepted and widely used as a new measure of poverty reduction. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> yes, the question of what is meant by universality is uh, going to come to or I'm sure, in the discussion. Um, let's turn it over to Yvonne. Are you ready to go? Yes. I am. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, and uh, good night from Cambodia to everyone. Uh, well, let me start just uh, by, first of all, uh, the appreciating the invitation to be part of this and uh, of this panel, and uh, and thank you very much for the introduction to to Dr. Spina Akaire, and uh, congratulations to Dr. Elina. I think it was a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, actually, with, with some of my questions that I am about to share uh, were uh, more or less answered with the, with the presentation. I think I have now uh, a lot more clarity on, on some of the things. Uh, but anyway, I prepared, uh, I don't know if you can actually see the slides. Excellent. Uh, just in order to, to make it in a, a little bit more orderly and uh, probably the help of the slides is, is good for me. So basically, uh, let me just uh, start by saying that I think it's a, it's a, this is a wonderful initiative and uh, uh, I'm actually looking forward to, to know more about it uh, and, and to see it in, in, in practice as a, as, a, as a measure that could be uh, adopted widely uh, around the globe. Uh, actually, things that I like a lot and I, it's probably worth uh, mentioning is uh, the global comparability, the fact that it's based on the global MPI, this uh, property of, the, of being a superset of the global MPI is fantastic, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's one of the great advantages of that. The, the gender perspective in, in some of the indicators is uh, is a great achievement, and the, it was probably one of the weaknesses in the in the global MPI. Some other indicators are very important for middle-income countries like internet uh, overcrowding, financial inclusion, health insurance, especially in the context of COVID-19. I think that health insurance can be something that. Um, of, of uh, great relevance. On the other hand, I have some questions, and uh, uh, I don't have probably the answers, but then uh, I thought that it was a good idea to share my uh, reflections after reading the paper with you. Uh, so, for example, in terms of uh, lower and upper middle income countries and how informative this measure could be, uh, how it compares with other moderate measures or measures for um, uh, middle income countries, MPI, uh, other middle income MPIs like the one we developed for Latin America and the Caribbean with OFI. Also, if, uh, uh, if there could be some alternative indicators of thresholds for particular uh, uh, indicators. Uh, the, the addition of dimensions and then also thoughts about the, the, the K cutoffs and, and how, what would be the shape of the K curves for this uh, moderate MPI. And then after that, that what would be forward looking in terms of uh, in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years regarding uh, moderate MPI like this one. So let me go, go very quickly on on the lower and upper MPIs, uh, 
it was very clear from Dr. Lina's presentation that the, the global MPI is literally informative in cases like, for example, Serbia or Thailand. And then uh, this kind of measure offers uh, some very useful uh, information regarding multidimensional poverty in these countries. Uh, also, the, the, the global MPI and the moderate MPI can offer complementary views in, in some of the countries, and, and we can see that in, for example, in Bangladesh, in Iraq, in Guatemala. But then the question is how relevant it would be for countries in, in, in which the, the moderate MPI approaches 100%. If we have 100% of the population that is poor, then probably it's, it, it, uh, the, the relevance of the measure is is um, uh, starts to to diminish, like in in the case of Tanzania, for example. No, so uh, I think this is a very relevant uh, measure for middle-income countries. But then, probably some of these middle-income countries are uh, still better with a global MPI. No, in terms of. Uh, uh, policy decisions or how to prioritize things. Uh, let me comment very briefly on, on some of the thresholds that were proposed in the, in, the, uh, in the paper. And for example, in years of schooling, we have now two persons, one male and one woman. But then what if, uh, what if we have a household with all males? with the six years of schooling, but only one woman, and with a number of men and women, adult men and women, then it would be not the right, but still the, the inequality within the house regarding years of schooling would be considerable. So one alternative to that would be if, if we move from, in the global MPI, from the uh, requiring only one adult to to have uh, the six years of schooling, to this uh, moderate MPI, if uh, any of the adults between 16 and 60 are have less than six years of schooling, for example, then to be deprived in, in years of schooling. Uh, that, I, I'm not saying that it's wrong at the moment. It's just that these are the questions, the kind of questions that I had when I was actually reading the paper and thinking, uh, if if there were alternatives to this, and maybe it would be interesting to see how the the measure changes if we change some of these thresholds. No, in terms of health insurance, for example, I read that Iraq was one of the countries with, that were increasing the most in health insurance. I mean, in 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 these indicators that is together with child mortality, but then. Uh, at some point in the paper, it says that healthy service in Iraq is free. And I wonder if it's universal as well. So if it's free and it's universal, then uh, probably people are not deprived in, uh, in access to health services, even if they don't have health insurance. So for example, what would happen with, with the UK if, uh, if everyone uh, has uh, NHS and they don't have a health insurance, uh, would they be deprived according to this measure? So maybe one alternative to think about this is uh, as privation of access to health services instead of uh, uh, health insurance. I know that the, the, the measure is also constrained by the data that is available, but then uh, again, this is this these were part of my my reflections. In terms of cooking fuel, at the end, this was the only indica indicator that didn't change in uh, the, the threshold of deprivation. But then, I wonder if we, if there is anything we could say about unsafe fuels or fossil fuels, for example, as a measure of uh, uh, related to environment and. It could be that uh, we could add petrol, gasoline, and kerosene to the deprivation list of uh, cooking fuels, and leaving gas and electricity does not deprive. So th there is room for actually changing this uh, this indicator as well. 
Uh, and then housing and overcrowding and probably some other of the indicators could be separate indicators, but I, I like actually I, I see the problem of of adding more indicators to the measure because the, the superset property of, uh, of poverty works really well and, and probably that's something that we want to preserve. So uh, let me go very quickly to the to the comparability with other moderate MPIs or middle income MPIs. And this is more or less the structure that uh, OFI proposed for Latin America. Uh, that is actually a different approach. It's, it's not based on the global MPI, but then uh, as, uh, as Elena mentioned, this, this has the dimension of uh, employment. And there are some other similarities, for example, in terms of overcrowding or access to internet, etc. No, but then uh, what, what would be um, the, would it be possible, for example, to do the similar, a similar exercise of comparing the global MPI with the moderate MPI, in comparing the, the, this middle income MPI with the moderate MPI that you're proposing? No, actually, this, for the six countries that we have data, is Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Mexico. And I think for all of them, it is possible to estimate the global MPI. And uh, for that reason, probably it is possible to estimate the moderate MPI. So it, uh, I think it may be worth comparing these two measures to see what would be the differences between between both. Uh, and, and that would actually provide a lot of information for for uh, policy making and for the adoption of, of, uh, of a global measure like this one, no? in terms of what are we losing with the, for example, by not including the, the dimension of employment. Uh, I wonder, I was actually thinking also on, on this super property and thinking would it be possible to include uh, another dimension, for example, the, the dimension of employment, like in in the uh, middle income country MPI for Latin America? And I think I think it's possible if we allow for the K to adjust. For example, in this case, with the global MPI and the moderate MPI, we preserve the K of 33%. Uh, that's one dimension. But if we add, add one dimension, one extra dimension, for example, employment, then as long as the K is 25%, it's, uh, again, uh, equivalent to one dimension, I think the superset property could be preserved. And this is just a thought because we know that it is not possible at the moment. But, uh, but uh, let me uh, uh, just say... Ivan, you're at 12 minutes now. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, just very quickly, just 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 to say that the the reflecting on the K curves and just because of this uh, question about the 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 K, the, how what would be the shape? Is it uh, like a this curve would be like a belly or it's concave, convex, or I don't know. And uh, in terms of forward looking, is it? What do we want? I know that the, the, these modern MPI is data constrained. Then what would be the next steps? If we could imagine the ideal modern MPI, what would it look like? Uh, uh, that, that would be the end of my comments that are basically questions or reflections that I have. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the extended my time. No problem, Ivan. Thank you so much for your insightful comments. Really appreciate it. Now let's move on to Khalid, please. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you. It's an honor and privilege to be invited to this uh, discussion. Um, and thank you, Sabina, for the introduction. Um, I really I find it in a, uh, in a difficult position here because um, almost uh, a lot of what I wanted to say has already been said by Ivan's excellent intervention. So I um, I will try to be as succinct uh, and as brief as possible. Let me um, also, for the purpose of organizing my thought, share uh, a 
a few slides. I've, okay, so um, and let me start with a couple of um, and let me start with a couple of comments. I, I'll try to be brief. I'll try to take no more than seven minutes, as uh, the time that was allotted to me. Uh, first, there is a conceptual issue, I think, which is important to, to begin with. What do we mean by moderate versus acute deprivation? Um, and this is, this is, I think, an important issue that we need to, to stop and reflect on, because in some contexts, um, even if we're changing the, the thresholds from, let's say, um, an acute level to a, what we think is a moderate level, we might not actually be measuring um, moderate deprivations. And I'll give you an example. In an LDC context, not having a primary de de degree is, is a measure of an acute deprivation, no doubt, um, I would argue. And, but if you go to a middle-income country, and even if you raise the bar to a secondary degree, um, not having a secondary degree may also be a reflection of an acute uh, form of deprivation. So uh, it's, it's really one has to stop and think about the context, the, the context in which we're measuring these issues. And you can apply the same argument, I think, for other issues, um, not having access to health insurance, if there's a societal context that offers alternatives, is very different than one in which there's no alternative. Having a car in a country that's uh, urbanly dense is very different than living in a remote area, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, even today, COVID, post-COVID-19, the importance that we attach to some issues like access to the internet and having a computer has changed dramatically because of the current context. The context is very important. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and I think the paper should begin with that and saying that no matter what you do, these contextual issues uh, and the problem of perfect comparability will remain uh, to some degree elusive uh, uh, in, 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 in some respect. So with this, uh, I think beginning this, int this introductory remark, I would like to also mention something else. The process is also very important. If you want this index, and I think it's a fantastic index, I really think it's a great piece of work, and it's something that if we had six, seven years ago, it could have probably saved us a lot of, uh, a lot of effort uh, at the regional level, because this is exactly what we were looking for. We were looking to have an index that speaks to uh, the Morocco's, the Egypt's, and the Iraq's of, of this region, and, uh, you know, and, and, and resonates with uh, the perceptions of uh, poverty as a phenomenon uh, uh, domestically and regionally. But uh, moving from a technical paper to having uh, acceptability, to building consensus, and in this case, global consensus, will not be a trivial task. It certainly took us um, I would say maybe less than three or four months with OFI, of course, as our partners, uh, to build a an index that we were technically comfortable with. It took almost three, four years to get the first uh, level of acceptance. Um, and then now we're in the seventh year, we're actually moving from one uh, uh, methodology to another and hoping and to get that also same level of acceptance. So it's not easy to get country buy-in. And you should also uh, be mindful of that. Taking this discussion at the global level is going to be a, a very uh, difficult challenge. So uh, with that, I would say that um, let me just have some specific uh, uh, comments here, which, uh, which I'm just going to skim through in order to leave also room for, uh, for discussion. And I, I would like to say that um, we also had the same um, dilemma and when we were starting to, uh, to, to think about the, the regional MPI. Should we start with the global MPI and then uh, tweak it and, and change the thresholds, or should we rethink the indicators themselves? And that, um, I think, <laughs> was a dilemma that um, was resolved as, as follows. We, we started the first uh, version of it with that, with trying to tailor the global uh, MPI. We're trying to stick to and anchor our narrative to the global MPI because it already had that global acceptability and because we believed in the rationale of having three dimensions and anchoring it to the human development approach. But uh, also there were some criticisms at the regional level, which you might also see at the global level. Sorry, did you lose me? 
I, we lost you for about you know 40 seconds i'm i'm very sorry i apologize for that. but uh, beirut doesn't have the best internet connections now what i was trying to say is that there could be very good reasons for you to uh rethink the dimensions themselves at the regional level but i agree that at the global level uh, uh sticking to the uh the three dimensions and anchoring it to the global mpi as a superset, I think that uh, idea is very is very important. So uh, let me also uh, go into some specific points to consider. Um, in the um, in in the Arab uh, MPI, we also consider to add additional indicators. But as Ivan said, the problem of comparability is going to be a very important binding constraint. So this is something you have to be mindful of and and. Uh, so when you include indicators like um, you know health coverage, adult malnutrition, internet, smartphones, uh, these indicators are not available to uh, most of the mix and DHS surveys that we are aware of. And at the regional level, that's the case. I assume it's the same at the global level. Also, the rationale for combining child mortality with health insurance in a single indicator, um, while convenient, but um, also might have to be conceptually defended uh, further. The same thing with the financial inclusion uh, aspect, which we proxied by the bank accounts here. You can't really equate that with assets ownership like TV, radio, etc. So you, you know, I mean, these are issues that I, I think have to be regarded, maybe perhaps regarded separately. Also, uh, quickly in the improved sanitation indicator, it's not clear why you're allowing a flush. Toilets, if I understood correctly, to be shared by four households. Wouldn't this be better if the index is to, uh, you know, uh, talk about sharing by household members instead of households? Or maybe I, I, I misunderstood the indicator. Uh, also, I share, um, and this is my final comment here. I do share Ivan's um, uh, comment on Iraq and the issue of health insurance because it would seem that in the case of Iraq, the uh, tremendous jump. And here I'm comparing between um, the results of the deprivation between our regional revised Arab MPI and uh, the uh, the global moderate MPI. Uh, MPI. Uh, it's uh, it's really quite uh, interesting to see that um, you know the the global moderate MPI overestimates almost by double uh, our uh, 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 headcount poverty for Iraq. It could be. Perhaps the, uh, an overestimation also due to the deprivation in the health insurance uh, coverage, which is extremely high. Maybe I'm not, I'm just speculating here, is because of the, the health insurance coverage in the Iraq survey didn't uh, ask the question to male household members, I'm told by the, uh, the, the statistician who worked on, on the survey. Uh, whatever it is, uh, it, these are uh, issues that I think need to be uh, considered. When it's one indicator that causes a, a significant shift, then we should be mindful of that. My final comment is that this is a great piece of work, but the relevance, I think, is, is, is uh, important. And um, again, if we come up with an indicator, and we're facing this with the LDCs that shows close to 100% deprivation in uh, countries and LDCs, how does that benefit the regional discussion or even the national discussion for that matter on poverty reduction? It's a, it's a tricky issue, but still I think it's a phenomenal piece of work and it's really very useful and uh, uh, well done uh, to the authors. Over to you, uh, uh, James. Great. Well, thank you so much for your comments, which uh, establish the importance of context and many other, uh, I think, interesting points for our author to return to us now and comment on. Um, as we prepare for her to join us, uh, we would like to extend an invitation to those in the audience to submit questions in the Q&A function. Helena? Great, thank you very much. And, and thank you <laughs> uh, sincerely for the, uh, for the very insightful comments. It's, it's great to have two such uh, experienced and, and generous generous discuss, discussants uh, who will help us to, to improve the paper. And uh, we have been thinking about the similar issues. So, so thank you very much for your guidance and, and drawing our attention to some of these issues. I will closely review all of them after the presentation. I will now touch upon some of the, uh, some of the issues that were raised uh, by both. Um, 
one of the issues was that whether this is relevant in Tanzania or whether this is relevant in low income context where the um, incidence might be close to uh, 100. Um, I agree that if everybody is poor, then what direction does that give to a policymaker? But I am very reluctant conceptually uh, to give a different standard for one group of countries instead of other group of countries as, as we're um, talking about universal values and, and every person's right to live a life in, in dignity and, and without poverty. So in that sense, there is uh, a unique significance and, and the instrumental value of showing <laughs> that in this country it is over 90. It is not unique to other poverty um, measures. Uh, in Mozambique, Tanzania, also the uh, upper level income indicators are above 90%. Uh, so, so they show the same picture of saying that a lot of people in this country are left behind. And that has uh, relevance for the global debate and that has normative uh, reference, although the um, indicator itself in the national policymaking context might not be uh, as relevant as you need to prioritize. And then you can look at the other, tra other gradients of this indicator, the subsets the global MPI or the destitute measure that will give you um, the possibility to break down the, the target groups for your policy interventions. So this is a way for you to plan ahead and see, OK, if, if we need to get these 90 something people out of poverty, this is what we need to do. But first, we might need to focus on this. So, so I, I think it is justifiable uh, to have a global indicator, even though it hits the roof uh, in, in some of the countries and being aware of that. And what does that tell us? Uh, you're both uh, talking about uh, the indicators um, and, and there are uh, scope for improvement. Uh, and I think we are at least trying to be very transparent about the uh, pitfalls and we'll continue to do, uh, do so. At the moment, uh, colleagues at OFI are, are doing a mapping of what, what is out there, what indicators could we use and how many household surveys are actually carrying these indicators. It's not just that they are theoretically there, but how many do we have <laughs> uh, at hand? Uh, and that will guide our refinement process going, going forward, keeping in mind your, um, your comments on that. I believe that if we were to add another um, dimension, even if we would uh, change the K to 25, that would break the uh, comparability. Uh, so, so then that would be the price of that, that change. Uh, it might be worth it if employer, employment was there. At the moment it isn't, but maybe in the future it, it could be. But if the K is 25 and one is deprived in employment, they would be multidimensionally poor, even though they might not be multidimensionally poor by the global MPI and thus the um, connection breaks. Uh, but I, I take your point in, in revising some of those and also a very thank you for the concrete suggestions for, uh, for example, adding um, or adjusting the cooking fuel uh, as that would provide some of the uh, environmental aspects that are very much in high demand. One issue that both uh, discussants uh, lifted was the um, health insurance and it's, it's not the optimal, as, as you mentioned, the context varies a lot. Um, and uh, you're right, the uh, question is not always uh, asked for all household members, and that is a requirement uh, in, the, in the indicator. So we will try to be even more um, explicit about that. The preferred indicator would be access to healthcare. However, that was not available. Uh, so we're trying to get the best possible available uh, indicator and we will bring these considerations back when we are refining the text and refining the, uh, the indicators. Um, also take your point on the fact that context matters and relative poverty uh, matters. So one deprivation in one context might not be the same as uh, in the other context and that will always be the case and that's the beauty and the complexity of, of poverty measurements. Um, However, also, as we were discussing in the in the beginning of my comments, uh, I think there is a value of setting some um, international standards and even in low income settings, secondary education nowadays is the um, 
the decisive factor on whether you're going to get a proactive job or not. So I, I think that is still carries uh, instrumental value uh, even in those settings. Um, the main challenge ahead, I think, uh, is to get the political traction. This is part of the journey. Uh, I hope you're with us on this journey or provide your best guidance uh, on how to go about. Because even if we would have the best technically and statistically best available indicator, uh, if it's not used, it will not guide the uh, policy. It will not bring the money where the mouth is. Uh, so that is absolutely crucial. Uh, and we will continue talking to our partners and engaging the uh, international community with us on this. Uh, and I hope that this continue discussion will continue past this seminar. Great. OK, so let's get into questions uh, from the audience. I'll start with Usha who uh, was asking, well, in a country with younger population, isn't it likely to have higher levels of deprivation in years of schooling with the cutoffs of nine years, while countries with older populations may show lower levels of deprivation since they have lower cutoff, six years. What are your thoughts on this? And I'll go on to say that Martha Sanchez has asked, uh, what about the gender dimension is it only addressed in education indicators? Was it considered for other spheres or indicators, for example, access to finance or internet or smartphone? So if you could address those two questions, it would be great. Thank you. Uh, good questions. And that brings the context into this discussion. When it comes to uh, the impact of population in the years of schooling, um, I possibly wasn't clear on this in the presentation. There are two indicators for the people who are under a uh, within the school age. We're looking at school attendance, uh, so they are not required to have nine years of of schooling as we do require for adults. For adults, uh, the uh, the uh, age span uh, is for working age adults. So if you have a grandma uh, at home uh, who was who went to school. Uh, quite some years ago, uh, and there's not much the government can do about it uh, that will not uh, impact the indicators. These are, uh, we're looking at what is needed uh, in the workforce for you to be proactively uh, engaged and that um, part of the population. So if you have a younger population, it might be that more of your uh, population has had better opportunities uh, going to school uh, and you might rank higher in that both when it comes to school attendance uh, and also having adults with at least nine years of, of education in your your household but I think that is exactly what we are <laughs> hoping to to capture in the societies where the majority of working age population do not have secondary education they are still competing on the uh, in the national labor market, then they are still going to be uh, worse off uh, in terms of income earning possibilities, in terms of their social capabilities. Uh, so I think we do um, sufficiently take into account the age factor when it comes to school attendance and working age population. But how it turns out uh, in the population uh, overall, I think that is uh, the point of the indicator to bring out those uh, those differences. When it comes to integrating gender in other um, uh, indicators than than uh, uh, education, uh, I think that is something that we need to bring with us uh, and see if we can develop it it further because I, I think there is a demand and traction to that. Some of the indicators are household specific. Uh, so, so it could be that the household has access to internet or, or a bank account uh, that can't be uh, pinned to an individual, uh, whereas education can. Uh, so there we are able to make that distinct distinction. Uh, for the health insurance, we require the family to have it uh, and thus um, are unable to capture uh, that gender dimension. But I think it would be good for us to go back once more uh, and see if there are meaningful ways of integrating in and bringing that aspect uh, in other 
ways because the uh, having access to secondary education is a proxy for empowerment and women's economic empowerment in the labor market later on and and other capabilities in the society uh, so that is what we are ultimately trying to capture uh, and there might be other ways of, of doing that so thank you for reminding us great now i know time is done but i'm going to say uh, you know just unilaterally another few minutes won't hurt so i'll ask one question myself uh, or maybe two. And the uh, first is really on the question of universality and your interpretation thereof. Uh, obviously, you're saying we need the same standard for all people in all countries at all time. Um, could be a different universality. I know outside of the region you're from, the notion of universality could be different standards per each country as per the country's own sense of its own priorities. Um, could you just have a discussion of that? I know that uh, I know your point of view, but it would be great to have a little bit of a discussion of that. Uh, but secondly, um, when you're varying the cutoffs of indicators, there's a potential trade-off between varying K. And can you please discuss that margin of trade-off and whether if you uh, raise the individual cutoffs, deprivation cutoffs, um, you know, do we have any idea as to the equivalent change in K, and if the equivalent change in K winds up with different people, just on that margin. That's an interesting margin, and I thought I'd ask you about it if you've uh, explored it. That's the end of it, and uh, please go ahead and respond. Um, thank you, and um, again, very, very good uh, good questions, and, and I very much agree with the point that the uh, uh, experience of what poverty means uh, means different things for different individuals, different groups, different nations. Uh, and that is inherently also described in the SDG agenda because it takes, says poverty in all its forms as defined by national definitions. That's the letter of the, of the SDGs. Uh, some countries, um, the Latin American countries were, were spearheading this and now more and more countries are coming on board defining their own national standards. And I think that is very welcome. Those are the indicators that are going to drive the policy development in these countries. And I think the ownership is, is crucial uh, on, on this part. This doesn't uh, aim to compete with those national uh, measures. This is aiming to complement uh, the national measures for these countries who don't have them, or also just to raise the standard of what we are talking about. Currently, we have been patting ourselves on the back and saying that poverty has been decreasing by a lot, which it has, and it has to be celebrated, but we also be, need to be sober about the challenges that are still there. And having an indicator that shows globally what the challenge still is and, and where the challenge lies uh, has um, an importance in the, in the global debate. I believe. So I, I think this would be a good complement uh, to the national indicators without taking the credit of or the ability for countries for themselves to articulate their needs and, uh, and priorities. And it, we, yeah, it's an important, interesting question. We haven't done uh, the sensitivity analysis or, or the comparison uh, with uh, changing the, the K versus changing the um, deprivation indicators. I think with the, if, you, if you don't do anything with the deprivation standard, you're, you can't say anything about the higher, higher levels of, of uh, indicators. It would be interesting if, to see whether we are getting the same group of people as, as poor, uh, if that would be the case with just her, uh, raising the cape, then what's, why bother <laughs> going through the other trouble of, of adjusting all the other indicators? My hunch would be that that wouldn't be the case. Uh, that, that would surprise me a lot. Uh, but it would be an, it's, it's an interesting research question for us to uh, take on board because I think that there is um, added value also for the policymakers to see what the problems are, how does it look like in my country, in different groups, and, and also being able to uh, follow that pro progress. And I think raising the K would possibly be uh, quite a remote proxy of this. But, but if they go into the same direction, uh, that would be a very interesting finding in itself. So, so that remains to be uh, studied. 
thank you for that idea. Well, and thank you. And uh, thanks, Sabina and Yvonne, Khalid. Um, really appreciate this wonderful conversation today on multidimensional poverty. And uh, for now, goodbye from Washington, D.C. and around the world. Uh, see you next time on uh, multidimensional poverty indices. Bye-bye.